point? Yeah, I can tell. That's, that's pretty good. I got some response. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting awake myself. And uh, uh, as was said by Atlee, my name is Ben Mansky. I'm the executive director of Liberty Tree. We're a pro-democracy group. And one of our program areas is around democratizing education. So I'm really excited to be here with all you guys because you came to be here with us today. Um, seem like live wires. Um, and, it, you know, it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a good moment, especially, I think, after the President's uh, semi-State of the Union last week, where he uh, articulated three domestic goals. Uh, and it, you know, it certainly struck me, and probably struck some of you, that two of those come together in this session here today, in fact, in this conference here today, higher education and energy policy. Right? So here we are, 12,000 people coming together, and we are the people who were at the point of production, we are at the point that the president has said is a national uh, priority for the for his administration. So I think uh, you know if there was ever any question about legitimacy before, I think that gives us a lot more operating room, a lot more breathing room to push the envelope, to get a little bit more militant with our actions and our organizing. Uh, so I'm encouraged by that, and uh, I also want to start us off by raising the question about about organizing. Uh, when we go out and we're organizing on the job, I don't know how many people here have done labor organizing, or if you're organizing your community, if you're organizing a particular issue, what's the first thing you do? You, you get to know the issue inside and out. You get to know your community inside and out. You get to know who the players are inside and out. And the other thing you do is you get to know your sector. You get to know your industry. If you're a labor activist and you're in steel, you want to know what's happening with steel. Not only you know, in central Illinois, not only in northwestern and northeastern Minnesota, right, uh, iron mining up there, not, but also in uh, Indonesia, right? What, what's the future of steel? Why are you at this point where prices are down, where you have consolidation? You know, why is U.S. steel getting closed down? You want to know those issues. Well, here we are. We're in higher education, and I think all too often uh, we spend a lot of time uh, getting to know other people's issues and other people's sectors, and we don't get to know our own sectors. We don't get to know higher education all that well. Maybe we know our own campus, we know the players, but do we really understand what's driving tuition? Do we really understand why it is that uh, you know, the university is operating on behalf of some interests and not others? And that's what I, I'm going to start us off and, and talk about uh, today, and then we're going to talk about a practical case study of you know, what we can do about it. Right? So is that, is that a good place to start? Yeah? Seeing some sparkling, some nodding heads. That's good affirmation. I like that. Um, so let's start off with the word, with a single word. And I'll tell you, I had a nice PowerPoint prepared for you guys today. And uh, we have a little problem of scarcity at this conference, which is the scarcity of projectors. So uh, I'm just going to operate off of this as my outline. And you'll have to imagine the things that I'm telling you about instead of seeing nice pictures to keep you occupied as you're waking up. Let's see here. All right, so the, the title of this talk is Campus Inc. Understanding and Overcoming the Corporatization of Higher Education in North America. Very academic sounding uh, you know, title there. Um, and I, I sort of frame this in terms of uh, a polarity. It's a spectrum. On the one end, you have corporatization. On the other end, you have democratization. I come from Wisconsin, and there was a great strategist who comes from Wisconsin. Right? He always said, the best defense is a good offense. Right? <laughs> And that's one of my mottos for political organizing. So if you're dealing with corporatization, you've got to have an offensive strategy. You've got to push them back. Because right now we've been in this, sort of in the middle of that polarity is public education, right? And they've been pushing public education towards the corporate. We've got to push it towards the democratic. So I want to define corporatization, first of all. And I use that word specifically, not privatization, for a very particular reason. For me, corporatization means the transformation of the public or the private into the corporate, right? Very simple definition. Uh, why is that important? Well, it's, a, it's important because it's distinct from privatization in that privatization connotes the idea that individuals get some rights. Right? It's the reason why in the Reagan Revolution they talk about privatization as a good thing because you know, we have this idea of personal liberty and freedom, and it's not an entirely bad idea. So they wanted regular people, working people, to believe that through privatization, they would get something. They would get some freedom. They, could, they would, get, would get some power. But in fact, when you look at it, when you look at all these examples of what they call privatization, it's never privatization. It's always corporatization. It's always turning over public resources 
public, uh, public institutions to corporations who then run them on behalf of a few people, right, uh, and not in the public interest. So I just like to start that way. Um, and in the case of education, it, corporatization of education, it's a transformation of public schools, colleges, and universities into corporate institutions. So, you know, in terms of a broad survey, what have been the effects of corporatization of higher education in the last 30, 40 years? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of those. Uh, it's, it, one, one effect we've seen is a shift in financing. Uh, you know, basically, students paying more, the public paying less, corporations footing a little bit of the bill, students paying even more, you know, and basically shifting the burden. That's resulted in tuition hikes, uh, you know, factor, depending on the school, anywhere from 300 to 400% real dollars since 1979, really incredible. Uh, a huge boom in student debt, a shift from grants to loans in terms of financial aid, um, changes in enrollment that are based again on fiscal policy, not on need. Uh, you've seen uh, major changes in terms of curricular priorities, what's taught, what's not, and also in terms of research. Where's the money for research on campus? And also, finally, in terms of governance and labor rights, the right to organize. So I just ran through all those, but those are the, the areas that to me stand out as being uh, areas of higher education that have really been affected by this process of corporatization. And I just want to give you something that's a little bit visual. If I had a picture here, you'd have a nice uh, you know, bar, uh, bar chart that you could look at the, uh, the numbers. But if you were to think of 1979, 1979, I don't know what you think of when you think of 1979, blank looks. Poker shock, yay. There we go. <laughs> Disco, you know, people not bathing very often, maybe there's some of that still going around. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, 1979 was a golden era for the United States. It was a golden era for higher education in particular. That was the high point. That was the best time for public higher education in the United States. That was the time in which the schools were most integrated, higher education was the most accessible. accessible. Um, the amount of money that a low-income family spent in order to fund somebody going to school was the lowest in terms of the proportion of their family <coughs> income. That was a high point. So you would think, in 1979, that's great. But for some people, it wasn't great. Uh, for the business roundtable, for other folks, they took a look at that and they said, hey, this is a problem. We have too many people going to college. And uh, it's creating instability. We have too many people who are qualified and diploma. Uh, too many brown people, you know, too many women. And they wanted that to change, right? And the other thing that they looked at is they looked at higher education. They said, there's a lot of waste here. Right? There's a lot of waste here. We have these enormous universities. We have all this captive labor. We have graduate students and faculty who are among the best and brightest. And they're all working on behalf of science. They're working on behalf of communities. And where's, where's that profit that could be captured? Where's that going? You know, are, are we really using our public universities effectively? And from their standpoint, the answer was no. They said, you know, why should IBM, uh, why should IBM uh, have to spend billions on research and development when IBM can just play a role uh, in terms of financing, uh, paying a little bit, putting a little bit of the bill at a, at a university, and then get the proprietary rights to the research. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So I talked about 1979. These people thought it was a problem. They did something about it. And as a result, what's happened since 1979 is that the um, the percent of funds that come to fund higher education today uh, from the public sector uh, is half of what it was back then. So if you, if you have you know, a budget of $100 billion and you know, $65 billion of that for UW, for your university system came from the public sector today, it would be $32 billion come from the public sector. Okay, so you've seen that. The graduation rate has actually gone down somewhat in that time. Uh, why? Well, uh, primarily because tuition has gone way up. And if you look at research on um, the, the research that's actually been done in terms of why people don't matriculate, why folks don't finish school, um, the number one reason that's cited across the board, especially for students of color, is cost. It's cost. Climate is two, right? Number one is cost. Uh, and, and that has had a very severe impact in terms of graduation rates. Um, I mentioned earlier that the, that the ratio between loans and uh, 
grants has shifted. It used to be that for every dollar of student loans that a student would take out to finish education, they would get two dollars in grants. Right? Now it's the opposite and it's getting worse. One dollar in grants, two dollars in loans. Um, and of course, uh, we, have, we are the most indebted generation in American history. And student debt is, uh, is not something that our funds go up. And I know he knows it's not something to be proud about, but uh, but yeah, we got to shout it to the rooftops. I mean, this is true, and it's largely because of the way in which the burden for uh, financing higher education has fallen on on us. Uh, you know, myself, I'm a lawyer, right? I graduated seventy thousand dollars in debt from public university. Um, I went into public interest law. You know, at my school, uh, going into the Going into the program, 10% uh, of students reported that they intended to do public interest work upon graduation. In the end, 2% do it. That's a lot better than most law schools, but I guess I, I raised the law example to show you that even in the professions like law and medicine, where you're supposed to get you know, people like, well, make them pay, it has a negative impact on society because uh, what it means is that uh, we get fewer you know, professionals who are really able to get out there and, and help people uh, with their skills. I also want to take a step back. Everybody still with me at this point? Great. Okay. Uh, I want to take a step back and recognize that this process of corporatization of higher education is also part and parcel of a process of corporatization that's happening in every aspect of our society, not just happening in education. It's happening in the military. Any examples of corporatization in the military? Blackwater, otherwise known as a private military company, right? PMCs, exactly. L3. What's that? L3. <coughs> L3 communications. L3 communications. L3 communications. Uh, how about elections? Any examples there? Diebold. Okay, Diebold. We have corporations that are basically counting our votes, right? Um, the Commission on Presidential Debates, private corporation, runs our debates, takes took it over from League Wound Voters. Um, so, you know, we got, we got examples there. Welfare. I mean, Clinton's welfare bill was a mass corporatization of public welfare, where you have welfare service providers, the companies. And make money off of administering our welfare programs, and you know it's insane. Right? It's it's really crazy. Uh, and on and on. In corrections and disaster management, in terms of policing, in terms of public spending, uh, in terms of genetics, right? The corporatization of the human genome, uh, and even in the area of law, with uh, the move towards uh, binding arbitration. Um, so you know this is this is not uh, this is not an isolated experience. How, how am I doing on time? So let's talk about what's driving it. And um, I think there are a number of things that are driving corporatization, that have been driving corporatization for the last couple of generations. Uh, one is the money power. You know, they pay the piper, they call the tune. Okay. And um, I was talking earlier about, uh, about the uh, research industrial complex. And I want to point to one specific law that also is circa 1979, that high point, that golden era. Anybody uh, know which law I'm talking about that was uh, passed by Congress in the signing of the law by Jimmy Carter? Really impacted higher education. By Dole Act, does that ring any bells? Okay, so this is sort of the one thing I want everybody to write down, keep in mind. The By Dole Act, named for Evan By and Bob Dole. Evan By, a Democrat from Indiana, Bob Dole, a Republican from Kansas. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, exactly. What's that? Uh, um, and it, I won't pay any more attention to you. It's good. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an example of, uh, it's, you know, I like to say that when you see something that's called bipartisan legislation, you better watch out. <laughs> this you're about to get hit upside the head, right? And it's just one, one perfect example of bipartisanship uh, of the tech that we really don't need. It was signed into law by Jimmy Carter. And basically what Bible did and does is it allowed universities to receive federal funding to engage in contracts with private companies in which the company uh, foots the bill for a portion of the research and they get the proprietary rates to the, or rights to the product. Okay. So basically, uh, at my school, my alma mater, Wisconsin, uh, Monsanto comes in and they say to the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, uh, we have some problems, you know, we want to develop, uh, we, we, have a, we have this problem, we have this uh, 
we, we have uh, this pesticide, an herbicide, uh, in Roundup Ready, which is, uh, it's getting to the point where the weeds are getting so resistant to Roundup that farmers are having to put more and more uh, on soybeans in order to uh, kill off the, the weeds. And, uh, and so we need to develop a new form of soybean that's especially resistant to our particular herbicide, to Roundup. And so we'll give you 20% of the cost, and that will help you to leverage some resources at the university. You develop this soybean for us, and we'll own it. And if any farmer wants to use our soybean, they have to pay us, right? So it's, also, it's not just the corporatization of research at the University of Wisconsin, it's the corporatization of life, <laughs> right? Um, and, and that's what happened, and it happened all across the country. And what you saw is that under the Bayh-Dole Act, you have this shift over time where it's almost like an asymptotic increase, this skyrocketing uh, involvement of corporations in financing uh, research at universities. And it's had uh, a very negative impact. Uh, it's had an impact even outside of public universities. How many people here are at research institutions? About half. How many people are at private schools? Maybe tech community schools? Okay, it's, it's had an impact across the board. You might think this is just, you know, University of Wisconsin or UCLA or something. No, it, it's had an impact across the board. And here's, here's how it's worked. Um, for one thing, it obviously drives the research agenda. I mean, you don't have a huge renewable sector out there that's able to, you know, buy off programs at different universities. Then they're, they're going to be uh, at a disadvantage to nukes, right, to coal, to, you know, other carbon energy sources. Right? Um, and so it's really had a negative impact. So for example, Monsanto came in and now the University of Wisconsin has a new biotech center. We have uh, Biostar building, just hundreds of millions of dollars coming in. Mostly public money and student money. It's funding all this stuff, right? Um, but we lost our land tenure center that was working with <laughs> peasants in Latin America on developing and sustaining uh, communities around sustainable agriculture. We lost that, right? Um, it's had an impact within, you know, these, these, all, these, these colleges and departments. It's also resulted in an internal marketization of each of these campuses. So across the country, you've seen social work, sociology, education, Chicano studies, women's studies. Now across the board, these, these schools, these departments, these programs have been closing down in the last 15 years. And it's because, you know, why? Because for the most part, Axon Mobile is not interested in funding social work. And if you're you know, running, uh, if you're the chancellor or president of a university, you're looking for where you can get every dollar, every $10 million, right? So it's driven the internal marketization of each campus. And then it has an impact in the higher edu education sector as well. It's had an impact in terms of community colleges and tech schools, um, what used to be called second tier schools within public university systems being at a disadvantage to the research schools, right? And so they find it harder to compete for the public funding because that's not where the state legislature is at. That's not where the energy is at, right? So now they try to go and compete for the dollars. The UW-Milwaukee, you know, in the UW system is, you know, putting all this money into setting up a new research park. And meanwhile, uh, for students, you know, first of all, we're footing the bill this is actually driving tuition increases in a big way. Because we have to pay for a portion of the, you know, the, the capital construction that's going on on campuses. We pay the salaries of these professors, you know, parts of them. They also, get, they also have contracts off campus a lot of times. So you know, it's really driving that. But also in the, in the higher education sector in general, like the tech colleges, you know, the, the liberal arts schools, they can't compete as well as they even uh, used to be able to. Um, so that's one aspect. You also see uh, the program of fiscal austerity, which I sort of made a uh, brief uh, reference to earlier. I mean, we saw uh, you know, austerity and its impacts in South America and Indonesia in the 1990s. Brought a whole wave of political change in those countries. Here we are, we're in a time uh, where we're suffering the consequences of austerity here in the United States. And I think we're seeing an upsurge. But really, the, the practice of fiscal austerity has meant, again, that public spending has gone down for higher education as a portion of the cost, tuition has gone up, grants have gone down, loans and debts have gone up, wages and benefits have been stagnant or even gone down, right? 
And uh, you know, the question is, you know, why is that happening? And again, uh, I think there's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. The folks who are responsible for that, they have uh, names and they have interests, uh, and it's, it's big business, right? Um, I mean, it's not a mystery. It's nothing shocking. Uh, it's not like the state legislature in each state goes forward and says, how can we you know, screw students today? <laughs> You know, that's, that's really not what's, what's going on. Um, they have lobbyists from the Chamber of Commerce, from manufacturers and commerce, different big business lobbies who are at their door, day in and day out. And they try to make and bake, break legislators, and they buy them, you know. And that's what we're up against. And most of the time when students are out lobbying against tuition hikes, you know, they don't even, we don't even pay attention to who's really, you know, who, you know, the, the Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? Um, I mean, there's there's a man behind the curtain, and one thing I would suggest to you is that um, by uh, by focusing on on the man behind the curtain, we can be a little bit more effective. Let's see here, I'm gonna back up. Another thing that's driving uh, corporatization is is not so much the money power; the people are just after profits for themselves. You know, looking to lower taxes on business. By the way, you know, everybody here knows that the tax rate on corporations is roughly one fifth to one seventh of it was in the 1950s, right? I mean, we used to have a much more progressive tax system in this country. So when I say that they're out there lobbying to uh, to cut funding for public education, again, it's not even necessarily because they're out there thinking how can we mess with the students. Uh, it, it's it's somewhat that, but it's mostly not. It's mostly that they're just like how can we you know lower taxes on. Um, but there are those out there who are ideologues who are thinking, yeah, how can we mess with the students? And they come in three, three categories. There's uh, the neo-racists, neoliberals, and neocons. Right? And they're not all the same folks. Uh, but they, they, they have their own agendas for higher education. I mean, like, we want to change the world, right? Right? Well, so do they. <laughs> you know, that's the deal. I mean, they, you know, they have another vision of the world. They think cor corporate America is, uh, is a good vision for America. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the neo-racists, I mean, we need to be clear about them. How many people are familiar with the bell curve? Okay. Wow, okay. Much more educated uh, group of people about, uh, about Charles Murray and all that. Um, how many people here knew that the, that book was funded by the Bradley Foundation? No okay. So it's good. So it's a good start. You know about the bell curve. You know about the attempt to uh, legitimize uh, structural racism, right? Um, but what you may not know, it sounds like you don't know, is that there is a uh, roughly billion-dollar foundation based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that paid for the publication of that book. And you know what else they paid for? They paid for Ward Connerly to travel around the country and attack affirmative action. They paid for the pseudoscience that led to the corporatization of welfare, the urban prison movement, right? <laughs> really, corporatization of corrections, right? Um, they have, they, they basically, they're the folks who are behind vouchers. It's the reason why Milwaukee became a laboratory for the introduction of vouchers, another form of corporatization of higher education, and, I'm sorry, primary schools as well. So, anyway, they're out there, they have money, they're promoting that agenda. No, you're in it. Um, number two, the neoliberals. Uh, we managed to beat them back a bit. Uh, I don't know if folks know about the GATS, General Agreement on Trade and Services. It's a side agreement to the WTO. Basically, they want to treat services like education, healthcare, uh, water, uh, as, as um, commodities as well, and uh, make them subject to their international trade regime, make it very difficult to, uh, for states and federal, for the federal government to show any kind of favoritism. Uh, i.e. investing in, in their own students, their own youth, <laughs> in their own communities, right? Um, so that's been part of the agenda too. And, and so far, uh, the good news on that is that we've been able to stop. Um, you know, there's international alliances that we can all be uh, linking up with that have been working against that agenda for higher education. Uh, we have the neocons. Uh, these guys, you know, David Horowitz, right? Uh, they recognize our power. They know who we are. <laughs> they recognize that students and labor are pretty key uh, in terms of uh, moving, moving forward, you know, in terms of building, building the left building for you know, a move towards a more sustainable society. And so they've been after us. And just in the same way that they've been busting unions and going after the right to organize and making it more difficult for labor unions to be involved 
in uh, politics and advocating for their members. They've been doing the same things to students, and they've funded a whole series of lawsuits. The Southworth decision came down in 2000-2001. Uh, that was an attack on the right of students to organize, the right of students to raise fees, right? So they've been going after us in that way, too. I'm guessing I'm nearing the end of my time, so I'm going to go off of this agenda, and I'm just going to say this. The final thing I think is driving corporatization is the lack of resistance from campus administrators. I like to think of them as lords of the manor, right? You go to a lot of campuses, the administration building looks a little bit like a castle. On a couple of campuses, I was even, even able to find they have moats around them. Okay? <laughs> kind of medieval. Uh, but, you know, what, what is the king, what is the lord of the manor most concerned about? Is he most concerned about the serfs and their conditions, you know, the students? Or are they most concerned about their infrastructure, maintaining the moat, <laughs> you know, making sure that they, you know, their walls aren't crumbling, uh, making sure that they, uh, that their higher ups are, are doing all right, right, that they have loyalty from the people around them. And when you get down to it, you know, a lot of these people are just motivated by naked self-interest, and they just want to protect what's theirs. So they, they look at what's going on, they understand what's going on in their sector in higher education. They say declining public support, we're up against these big corporations, they're trying to take us over, do we fight them? You know, or do we play the game? And their decision has been to play the game, almost across the board. Um, lots of campuses, students have gone to administrators and said, why don't you join with us? You know, why don't you work with us? Why don't you lead a march, for example, as the rector of the UNA, uh, the Autonomous National University of Mexico City famously did, I think in 68, led uh, hundreds of thousands of students in a march for higher education to the streets of Mexico City. Uh, why don't you do that? And by and large, they decide not to do that. Um, so, you know, I, I started off by saying uh, that the best defense is a good offense, and that's really what building a campaign for democratization is all about. And if you're about climate change and confronting climate change, and you, you can see from, my, from what I've said already, the links between uh, the priorities that go on in terms of research priorities on every campus and the dollar priorities, right? Green campus, well, are, how much money are they going to put into that versus putting it into biotech, right? You can see also how that's tied to the crisis in higher education, you know, the crisis in financing, this debt, um, the tuition hikes. Um, and that's just what I wanted to share with you and to lay that out. Um, I can talk about strategy and democratization and boards of regents and student strikes and other stuff, but I also know that my two uh, co-presenters can do that as well. So I'm going to stop right here and uh, turn it over, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion when we're done. December, the occupation. I know some of you might have heard about it. Um, so, uh, for any of those who don't know, Bob Carey is a former senator of Nebraska. He was a commanding officer uh, during Vietnam, and he oversaw the massacre of civilians um, in uh, Thon Phong in 1969. And he became the president of the New School in 2001, uh, despite not having a PhD. And uh, the New School was founded, it has a very progressive history, it was founded as the University of, in Exile um, during World War II, and it was a uh, safe haven for a lot of uh, academics uh, from Germany, Jewish academics, uh, who were uh, forced out of their university during the rise of Hitler. And um, it's, since then it's had a, a very uh, progressive mission, uh, and a, a very um, social justice kind of theme about the school, and um, Carrie, uh, despite <laughs> supposedly being uh, a Democrat, uh, was one of the most aggressive supporters of the Iraq War in 2002 and 2003, and um, in 2000, and last year, 2008, 
he, uh, the final straw was after his seven years at being the new school, he uh, fired his fifth provost, Joseph Westfall. Um, and this is a, this is a theme of, of his uh, autocratic form of rule at the new school where um, the provost, which is one of the most important positions uh, at, a, at a university, the head of all the academic planning, um, basically Kerry and his vice president have been trying to control uh, that, that position. And one of the ways they've been doing this is by uh, firing provosts. And so right after that, the faculty had an overwhelming uh, majority vote of no confidence against Bob Carey. And that was on, uh, on December, December 16th. And the day after, uh, December 17th, um, some students got together and decided that they wanted to have a response to this. And that's what prompted uh, the occupation of uh, the building at 65 Fifth Avenue in New York. And one of the reasons that we decided to occupy this building is because not only has uh, Carrie been, you know, uh, scaling back every program at the new school, but he's been redirecting these funds towards so-called capital improvements. And there was supposed to be, uh, there's this building plan in the works at 65 Fifth Avenue. We're not allowed to use most of the space at this building despite barely having any space at all at our university. But we're, this, this is basically just this big empty building that we're not allowed to use because it's supposed to be torn down to build this like big mega super building. But um, we, don't, we don't know when it's gonna happen. There was no student or faculty involvement in the planning of this building. We don't know what it's gonna be used for. And uh, right now we have no space at our, at our school. We have no financial aid. Um, and, uh, and we have no library. Our library got moved to, which used to be in that building, got moved to a much smaller building and spread out across a bunch of floors. And um, so also when Carrie, in the seven years Carrie's been in power, he's basically appointed like all his friends to the board of trustees so that when the faculty had the vote of no confidence in the board of trustees meeting the next day, they all gave, knowing about the vote of no confidence, gave him a standing ovation and expressed their full support and confidence in him. Um, and one of the one of the people that Kerry appointed to the board of trustees is a man named Robert B. Millard. Robert B. Millard is the uh, uh, executive, the chairman of the executive committee of a corporation called L3 Communications. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it's the seventh largest military <coughs> contractor. Um, some of their subsidiaries can, uh, include MPRI, uh, who funded and trained, or not funded armed and trained both sides uh, during the Bosnian conflict in the 90s, and they also um, armed and trained uh, Georgia prior to and during uh, their attack on Russia. Uh, Tight Corporation, who's um, currently facing four lawsuits from Iraqis torture to Abu Ghraib, is another one of their subsidiaries. And, um, and so, Millard is the head of this corporation. L3 has a standing army in Iraq that's uh, larger than Blackwater. And they they employ all the translators and intelligence personnel at all the illegal detention centers. So basically, the torturers. And this guy's the treasurer of our board of trustees. And he's also he also was a managing director of Lehman Brothers, which the company at the heart of the financial crisis right now. And he also uh, he also is is on the board of an offshore drilling company. And it's just some of the lovely things this man does. <laughs> and so. Um, so that's that's a, another example of of what happened. So so at this occupation, um, it was it was uh, me and Atlee's group, but also a lot of other individuals at uh, at the new school that weren't part of any groups. And we at the first day of the occupation, we uh, came up with a list of demands, and I have them right here. I'm going to read them to you. So one is amnesty for all participants in the student movement, including Elliot Liu, who was the only person arrested. Staff and security guards affected by this protest shall receive appropriate compensation and no repercussions for dutiful fulfillment of their jobs. Number two, that students may use the GF building at 65 Fifth Avenue until a suitable replacement is secured. That all capital improvements at the university shall be suspended and these funds shall be redirected towards A, an autonomous student space where we can study and engage in group work. B, scholarships and tuition. C, a respectable library that students will be included in the decision-making process in order to establish a viable plan for student space. Number three, 
that all investments and finances shall be fully disclosed so as to permit complete transparency and intelligibility of the creation of a socially responsible investment committee. I'm going to talk about three more in a minute. Number four, that an equitable and authorita authoritative tripartite committee, including faculty, staff, and students, to select an internal provost as well as a permanent replacement for provost and a new president and vice president, for which there will be no presidential veto for this committee's decision. Five, that there be regu uh, regularly appointed a stu <coughs> student as voting member on the Board of Trustees. And number six, that President Bob Carey, Executive Vice President Jim Murtha, and Treasurer Robert Millard be removed from their present positions at the university. We ask that these demands are binding and that they be met in writing on your school university letter as signed by President Bob Carey or members of the Board of Trustees before we leave this building and that they be presented to students in the second week of spring semester. So we didn't get Carrie and Martha and Melinda yet, but we're going But um, we, I have right here the letter that was uh, was signed by Bob Carey um, at the end of the 33-hour occupation, and it has the concessions that were made, um, which number one, um, I agree to uh, grant complete amnesty for all participants involved. To I agree that students may use the GDF building at 65 Fifth Avenue until a suitable replacement is secured and instituted. Um, and the alternative space that we were supposed to get till spring semester, we got it all fall semester because of because of the occupation. Um, three, I agree that students will have voting representatives on, on the search committee for the interim provost and the provost. Um, we got that demand met, but Carrie still. Um, still is viewing this committee of searching for the new provost as an advisory committee and he was supposed to announce the new provost this past week. He hasn't announced it yet. And there's a lot of speculation that he's he's not going to go with the recommendation from the from the committee that included students and faculty. Um, but but we have it signed here that he should. Um, for I agree for student participation to establish a committee on socially responsible investing, SRI, for the university's endowment, and that this committee will then establish an independent auditing process within the SRI framework. Um, I agree to grant the student senate the ability to communicate with the student body freely without constraint. And this one was really important because previously our student senate did not have the ability to email all the students, but now they have that power. Um, and number six, I agree that a representative of the USS, should, the, the university students at it, should be allowed to have a non-voting representative at meetings of the board of trustees. Um, so our demand, as you remember, was voting, but, um, but we didn't win that demand yet. So um, the Socially Responsible Investment Committee, uh, which Kerry agreed to establish in this letter, he uh, sent out a long email in response to an email that was sent by members of our organization about the state of the university. He sent out a long email about um, the economic state of the university. And he mentioned the SRI responding to a point in the, in the email he was responding to. He said that um, it should be established as an advisory committee, which basically means he wants it there to make it look like he's doing something, but not to have any actual power. And um, also, he hasn't agreed to disclosure yet, and the, and the, uh, the university faculty just passed, uh, uh, last month just passed a resolution uh, calling for the disclosure of the university's endowment. Um, and that was one of our original demands that wasn't met yet, and it's going to be quite impossible to have an effective socially responsible investing committee without disclosure of the university's endowment. And um, what we thought, when we demanded for this SRI, when we uh, came up with a proposal for it, um, what we had in mind was to have uh, a committee that can address issues like people, with people like Millard and people on the board trustees, that, the friends that are, that are getting all the investments from the new school, but we can also redirect that towards green jobs and redirect that money towards, um, towards, uh, uh, industry, or, towards uh, institutions that are environmentally sustainable and that are um, furthering the social justice causes. Uh, and I think that's really, uh, really, really key because we don't just want to, um, we don't just want to divest our university's funds from human rights and violate uh, corporations and, camp and industries, but we want to help further, um, further other causes that are, that are countering these. 
Um, so Adley's going to talk a little bit more about that. But um, April 1st is our deadline for Carrie and Bertha and Millard to resign. And if they're not resigned, if they don't resign by that day, it's, it's when we're going to take a much larger action, something perhaps along the lines of the occupation, but more large scale. And um, we've been building for three years, um, talking to faculty, talking to other student groups. And I think right now the climate at the new school is um, really, really perfect for, for complete restructuring of the administration and of the way that the university is run from a top down to, for, to a more bottom up way. And I'm really excited for what's going to happen. So thank you. Here's Adam. Um, yeah, it, it was really funny. The new school, um, I mean, it was started many, many years ago by people who were fleeing persecution. And obviously, our main interest at the new school is um, related to the war, uh, related to, to other issues, of course. But it, but it was really humorous because it did get to the point where we didn't really have a library. Like, can you imagine? I mean, I'm sure you all go to real universities that actually have libraries, books and things like that. I know it's radical, right? We, did, we didn't even have one. So we had, we had to actually demand to have books at a, at a university. It was insane. It was utterly insane. But that was the reality of the corporization that was happening at the new school. I mean, unlike, it, it's really funny because I came to the university thinking it, was, thinking it was following this mission. And there were lots of things that we don't have or we just got at the new school that a lot of other universities take for granted. Like, I mean, as organizers, we probably all deal with like the student senate, for example. I, I, I'm sure half of the people when I mention the student senate are thinking like, oh my god, I went to one of those meetings the other day for forever, and we didn't get anything done. We didn't even have a student senate. We had no, no like shred of institutionalized power where we as students could go and advocate for change. So that was one avenue we did. We made sure that we got 25% of the seats on the student senate in order to to best leverage our power, develop relationships with the faculty and the faculty senate. So we knew who on the faculty senate was on our side and how to how to work with them and push forward on the issues that that we deemed most important. Um, I, I actually don't want to talk about uh, social responsible investing too much. I kind of would like to talk about where we started this whole campaign off because 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 this conference is focused on the environment and our our, our campaign focused mostly around, around the war. I wanted to explain a little bit about this individual that we focused on, because it wasn't just, the focus was on the president of the university, Bob Carey, and how he didn't fit with the university, how his approach to governing the university was very, very authoritarian, not listening to the students. But we, we, we wanted to challenge the power dynamics at the university because we wanted a more fundamental transformation, A, of the structure of the university itself, but we, we as students wanted to have the power to use the university to make the changes in the larger society we wanted. So for example, we, we initially started looking at the people who were in control of our university, the Board of Trustees, and saying, who are these people? What do they represent? What industries do they represent? And how does that fit with the mission of our university? Not every university has a board of trustees. If you're a public university, usually it's a board of regents, board of governors. Sometimes they're elected by the, the, the voting populace. Sometimes they're, they're just appointed by the, the governor or various, various people. So we, we, we searched through them. We searched through them. I mean, we knew that we didn't actually have voting representation on this governing body. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of beyond me that we don't, and I think they're probably regretting the fact that, that we don't have this right now. We, and we found, we found this individual, Robert B. Millard, and we said to ourselves, this is somebody who sits in this position, this, this, this board of trustee, who's supposed to have the best interests in the mission of the university, the university at heart. And yet we knew, we, we knew we, where we stood as students, and I imagine that, that uh, all of you stand in a very similar position. And we said, okay, well, you've got, you've, got, you've got L3 Communications, you're in charge of that, yep, that, that company's going to federal court for torture and conspiracy to commit, commit mass torture, that's probably not the best thing in the world. Um, the, your company was heavily invested in subprime mortgages, uh, purposefully and more, more directed than the rest of the companies that were doing it, that's why your company's bankrupt, and that's the start of a larger economic crisis that's probably not, uh, not helpful for us or healthy, healthy in any way. 
and also in charge of uh, the chairman of what is it, Golf Mark Offshore Drilling Company, and two other two other offshore drilling companies, as well as a as well as a financial firm that deals specifically in investing money in companies that want to start up so they can do more more drilling. And he's also on the Council of Foreign Relations, so you know when we go to places for oil and natural gas, he's he's right there. They got it. They got the money to invest in the pipelines. They got the companies that are in charge of getting the oil to where it needs to go. They've got the people who are going to train to control the areas. One of the one of the L3 subsidiaries is called MPRI, Military Professionals Resources Incorporated. It's made up of a bunch of former generals, former generals, right? And so when they want to, when they want to, um, they have a product that they sell. It's called Democracy and Governance. No, I'm serious. Go to their website. Go to their website, Democracy and Governance. You can click on the button, and they tell you what it is. And what they do, so so when they want to when they want to protect those pipelines, they have MPRI come in. And it's kind of strange, a private company that, that uh, does governance work. But anyway, so we we focused we focused on this individual because we said, I mean, a it was about the power dynamics at the university. It was about having a say in the decisions that get made, the decisions that get made at the university that affect us, whether it be tuition, whether it be how the university invests its money, which obviously gets used, gets used to cut tuition costs in a, in a variable level during different, different conditions. But we said, but it, but it, was, more about, it, it was more about the message that we wanted to send, that the, of the process of this corporatization of higher education, the corporatization of society in general, because ultimately, if you would go home and investigate who really has the, the governing power over your university, You'd find that probably it wouldn't be as heinous as an example as, as, as Millard. We were kind of uh, shocked at, 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 at this person. But you'd no doubt find a lot of people. You'd, you'd find that the people who are actually in charge of your university, very much so, like Ben said, are people who sit in upper management positions at places like Exxon Mobil, Marathon Oil. So, so, so many. So many. And it's really indicative of it's really indicative of the power dynamics we have in society today and that we are trying to transform, pushing for renewable energy and things like that. We really, as students especially, not having, not having a large degree of say in our university. Going up, it's really funny because we go up against the people who are, they control our university. And I mean, I mean don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that they're, they're all terrible people, obviously they care about some of them, part of them, care about philanthropy. They, they donate a lot of money to the university, and it's not all just because they want a final product. The case is true with, with Millard just as, just as well as, as any people. But it really, is, it really is about a larger struggle, and it really is, it's not just something that, that's within universities. In any, in any workplace, in communities, it's about actually having a say in those divisions, decisions that affect you. So, so people, so people in, in a neighborhood don't have a, a board of trustees that they're going to to, to make change, obviously. They, they, have, they have elected representatives that, that are certainly better than trustees of a university. But it's about, it's about sharing the responsibility and developing, developing that work, not only inside our university, fundamentally transforming it, but, but outside as well.